Chairman, uh, may I begin this evening uh, as a trustee of the Windsor Leadership Trust by adding my welcome as a trustee to you to this annual lecture and offering the hope that next year as a trust we can get a really good speaker and have not to use one of our own staff. <laughs> <clears throat> or as they say in some non-conformist churches when they're struggling for a preacher, next week it'll be own brethren. But that's it, of course. I'm absolutely delighted to be giving uh, this year's lecture. Um, thank you all uh, for coming, uh, and I'm most grateful to our chairman for his very generous um, and somewhat misplaced introduction. Now, the, yes, the title I've been given this evening, um, or taken this evening, is Leadership in Turbulent Times. And at first sight, a few months ago, when I originally accepted the chairman's invitation to speak tonight, that seemed then to be a somewhat easier challenge than it does now. Financial turbulence, political turbulence, Afghanistan turbulence, all those things notwithstanding. But I think that concern of mine rather misses the point. If leadership is to be of any real value, if leaders are to really earn their pay, then it's in turbulent times when the real qualities will out, where the real value will be added, and where true leadership will be displayed, and not when everything is going swimmingly and according to plan. So I would suggest that leadership is for turbulent times. And turbulent times are the context in which effective leaders should thrive. After all, um, where in the history books would Winston Churchill have sat without the menace of national socialism? Or where would Margaret Thatcher have sat without the challenge from Argentina? Or indeed the challenge from the National Union of Mine Workers? Yes, and one conversely has also to recognize that weak leaders who fail in turbulent times are cruelly exposed, promoted probably beyond their level of competence, as Professor Norman Dixon suggested some time ago. But of course, as alumni of the Windership Leadership Trust, that's not us. <laughs> so let me offer briefly some views on the leadership challenge more generally, uh, as a lead-in to this evening and to our subsequent discussions, first mine with Martin, and then, at risk, some questions from the floor. Of course, at the outset, not only do we recognize that leadership is an important subject, but I strongly suspect we can all agree that it's a fundamentally difficult area. After all, discussion has long raged as to whether leaders are born or whether they're made, if they're made, how is it done, and what qualities and characteristics should they exhibit. But I would contend that whether leadership is gifted or acquired, it's more useful to consider what leaders actually do. And I'll come back to that as a substantive point in a moment. But now, like having perused the list, and I can't quite see everybody here, but like a number in the audience, uh, I first came across leadership as a subject to be considered formally while I was a cadet at Sandhurst. It was treated differently uh, to other subjects that we studied. For leadership discussions, we didn't sit in the classrooms, the halls of study, as they're famously called there, but we sat around in armchairs in the company bar, or anteroom, as it's more properly called, and we were asked for our, our, our ideas, as opposed to just being told what to do and, and what to think. And I believe that immediately sets leadership apart from the other more technical things you need to know in any profession. Leadership is a personal thing. It's an, indi indi it's an, indi an individual thing. It's an intuitive thing. But despite that, I don't go as far as to subscribe to the notion that leaders are born uh, and not made. Yes, um, one concedes, a bit of natural leadership helps a bit. And a lot of natural leadership, I think, helps a lot. But if you have any leadership ability, then thinking about the subject, studying the subject, experimenting, modeling yourself on a leader you respect, all those things can really pay dividends. But when we sat in our armchairs at Sandhurst, we had a range of what we thought were fairly erudite discussions. On the one hand, listing the qualities of a leader, and on the other hand, debating the merits of a more functional approach to leadership techniques. Now, I recall extensive discussion about the thoughts of one of my predecessors as head of the army, the late Field Marshal Lord Harding, and he'd produced an impressive list of the qualities, in his view, to be exhibited by a good leader, based obviously on his experiences. He said a good leader needed absolute fitness, complete integrity, enduring courage, daring initiative, and undaunted willpower. And interestingly, he stressed the adjectives as well as the nouns, absolute fitness, complete integrity, enduring courage, daring initiative, undaunted willpower. And to these, he added three other prerequisites, knowledge, judgment, and team spirit. Now, you're probably thinking, that's all good stuff 
from a soldier's perspective, certainly applicable in the battle space, but I think on reflection, probably also more widely applicable in the business space and elsewhere. But as respected and useful as possession of a large number of key qualities is, our discussions at Santos also turned to functional models of leadership behavior. At that time, and we're going back to 1969, 1970, the action-centered leadership model put forward by Professor John Adair, then of the Industrial Society, and a much respected fellow of the Trust, was very influential. His three balls Venn diagram approach of the individual, but overlapping and interlocking leadership elements had much resonance with us as cadets. His model required the identification of the need to blend identifying and achieving the task with maximizing the efforts of the team, and perhaps most critically, looking after the interests of the individual. And to us, those three elements together all seemed like a winning formula. And I think actually that single construct of task, team, and individual still, I think, has great merit. But one wonders, uh, is that enough? Now, while a dry debate about the merits of a qualities approach or a functional approach is interesting if you like dry debates, it remains essentially theoretical, and I think by definition not that useful. As I discovered a year or so out of Sandhurst when I hit my first really complicated leadership challenge. It was on my second tour of duty in, in Northern Ireland. Actually, the, the first one hadn't been um, that easy, quite tricky, inheriting a platoon of 27 soldiers and only having 19 left three weeks later. But that's, that's another story. The problem I had next time was far more complex. The little bit of Belfast I was responsible for was bang slap on the sectarian divide, uh, and the issue was housing. Now, the details don't matter now, but to my great relief as a second lieutenant, the general officer commanding Northern Ireland came to visit my patch. Um, I walked him around the area, I explained the problem as I saw it, and in my innocence asked him, Sir General, what do I do? He put his arm on my shoulder and said, Well, Richard, we've got broad shoulders in the British Army, just muddle through. Which, of course, is exactly what we did. <laughs>